talk is concerned with a branch of mathematics now known as linear algebra. It is one of the foundation courses of mathematics. A knowledge of linear algebra is necessary for any further study of algebra, but it is also a prerequisite for many topics in analysis, geometry, statistics, and in numerical analysis. It is a remarkable fact that this basic topic has undergone more drastic changes during the last 60 years or so than almost any other elementary course in mathematics. It is not only the presentation which has been changed, but also the content. And I should like to tell you a little more about this evolution and how it came about, but also offer some explanation. When I was a student, more than 50 years ago, this uh, course, which we now call Linear Algebra, was entitled The Theory of Determinants. It consisted of about 50 or so lectures altogether, 30 of which were about determinants, and the others were about matrix calculus, in particular the eigenvalue problems. There was no mention whatsoever of uh, vector spaces. The principal topic of discussion was the solution of an arbitrary system of linear equations. In the regular case, the solution was written as the quotient of two determinants known as Kramer's rule. About 1930, however, there was a tendency to play down the, uh, the role of determinants. And I remember seeing an interesting textbook on algebra by Helmut Hasse, in which one of the chapters was proudly entitled A Determinant-Free Treatment of Linear Equations. By that time, the theory of matrices had become common knowledge amongst mathematicians. It was widely used in many branches, and in particular, it was used to discuss the theory of linear equations. But already then, there was a tendency to have a rather different uh, uh, presentation of linear algebra. The abstract school of mathematicians, flourished in, mostly in Göttingen in Germany, had produced a totally different uh, uh, approach to algebra. And from there, we learned that uh, the best way of doing linear algebra is to close it into the language of linear vector spaces and linear maps of spaces. I will say about, more about this later on. So altogether, I distinguish uh, three phases of linear algebra. First, there was the period in which determinants were predominant, which lasted for a very long time. Then we had matrix theory as the principal tool for treating linear equations, and now the modern way of using vector spaces. It is sometimes said that um, matrix theory is one of the topics of modern mathematics. However, this is not at all true. In 1858, Arthur Cayley published a paper about 20 pages in length, which was entitled A Memoir on the Theory of Matrices. The precise history of the word and of the uh, theory of matrices altogether is somewhat obscure. Uh, it seems that Cayley's friend, Sylvester, had used the word matrix some years before the paper was written, though in a slightly different context, more in connection with determinants. It was also pointed out by the historian of mathematics, Thomas Hawkins, that many of the ideas contained in this memoir by Cayley were not altogether novel. In fact, had been used by Gauss and by some of Gauss's pupils a long time before Cayley wrote his paper. It must also be remembered that Hamilton had discovered quaternions about 15 years before Cayley's paper was published, and Cayley was well aware of this discovery, and some of the ideas that make the theory of quaternions are rather similar to the ideas which are used in the theory of matrices. 
However this may be, Cayley has nevertheless earned a considerable amount of credit for having written this paper at that time because it made very clear the new thesis that matrices should be regarded as mathematical objects in their own right, having their own laws and properties distinct from numbers and other objects in mathematics. And I would like to take you at least through some of this remarkable paper by Cayley, not in order to give a lecture on matrices, but to show how old these ideas are which only recently have become common knowledge. So let us then start, as Cayley did, by considering some uh, equations which we call linear equations. I've taken here as an example two equations in two unknowns, x1 and x2. Cayley, in his paper, used three uh, uh, unknowns and three equations, but the ideas which are necessary for this purpose are much the same as for the two by two case, and in order to save writing, I have taken the liberty of abbreviating Cayley's work to the two by two case. Now here we have then a set of equations uh, where y1 is equal to 2x1 plus 3x2 and y2 is x1 plus x2. We can regard this as an operation which moves the point x with coordinates x1, x2 to a point y with coordinates y1 and y2 in a plane. And we call this operation just alpha. When we deal with uh, transformations of this kind in general, we now favor the double suffix notation, where we write y1 equals a11x1 plus a12x2 and so on, using uh, a notation where the first suffix refers to the equation and the second suffix refers to the variable or unknown, which which this coefficient is associated. Incidentally, for our purpose, the coefficients which occur in this work can be taken to be real numbers. Now, it was pointed out by Cayley, and indeed by some mathematicians before his time, that any pro property that this transformation might possess must reside entirely in the set of four e coefficients which appear in these equations. He therefore collected these four coefficients, a11, a12, a21, a22, into a square array which he calls the matrix of this transformation. For example, the numerical case which I have quoted would have the matrix 2, 3, 1, 1. Now Cayley proceeds to develop the idea that we should regard matrices as new, a new kind of mathematical object. And he proceeds in a very systematic way to explain the various rules and properties and laws which these new objects must obey. <clears throat> Beginning then with equality. What do we mean by saying that two matrices are equal? And for the purpose of this talk, a matrix will always be a two by two matrix. So supposing we have two such matrices, A equals A11, A12, and so on, and another matrix, capital B, B11, B12. We shall say that A is equal to B if and only if all corresponding coefficients are the same. So A11 equals B11, A12 equals to B12, and so on. In other words, if two matrices are equal, then this means we have four equations between the four uh, coefficients. The next point is how to multiply a matrix by an ordinary number, real number in our case. Well, this is done by the following rule. Uh, if k is the number in question, then k times the matrix A is a matrix whose coefficients are k A11, k A12. In other words, we multiply a matrix by a number by multiplying each of its coefficients by that number. For example, 4 times the matrix 2, 3, 1, 1 is the matrix with coefficients 8, 12, 4, 4. 
Next, we come to the pro uh, problem of adding uh, two matrices. So we take two matrices A and B as before, and we shall say that their sum A plus B is the matrix whose coefficients are obtained by just adding corresponding coefficients of A and B. When you add, you are interested in what is called the zero of addition. And so we define the zero matrix as the matrix all of whose coefficients are equal to zero. And this matrix will have the property, obviously, that A plus zero is A, as one would expect. Also, it is easy to see that subtraction follows and that we must define A minus B as the matrix obtained by subtracting the coefficients of B from those of A. It is, however, when we try to multiply two matrices that the algebra, the laws which we have to follow, become very different from the multiplication of numbers. In order to explain how one multiplies two matrices, Cayley goes back to the original origin, namely that a matrix stood in for a transformation in the plane. So let us then suppose we have two transformations, a transformation beta, which moves the point x into the point y, and a transformation alpha, which moves the point y into the point z. Uh, the transformations are given each by two equations, which I have written down below. The beta is y1 equals b11 x1 and so on. Alpha stands for z1 equals a11 y1 and so on. Now if we want to multiply the two equations or find their resultant, then uh, algebraically this means that we have to eliminate y and go straight from x to z without stopping at y. Now, this elimination can be carried out algebraically uh, in a very simple manner. We take the two equations which we have just written down and uh, systematically eliminate the variables y1 and y2. So that z1 becomes a11 and the bracket that follows was the definition of y1 and plus a12 and again the bracket that follows was uh, expression for y2. If you write all this down, you get a fairly complicated uh, pair of equations, but you can collect terms in x1 and x2, and you get something like, say, a system called gamma, which reads that z1 is equal to c11x1 plus c12x2, and so forth, where if you carry out the uh, calculations in detail, uh, you will find that C11 is equal to A11B1 plus A12B1. C12 is A11B12 plus A12B22, and so on. Uh, <coughs> so that the new coefficients C11, C12, etc., have been expressed explicitly in terms of A and B. Now, this gives rise to the formal definition of a matrix product. We have two matrices A and B. We shall say that C is the product of A and B, where C is given by the four coefficients obtained at the top of this uh, screen. Now, this is a rather complicated and perhaps uh, it would seem difficult thing to uh, understand. And so Cayley goes to great length to explain to the reader how one can easily learn to form a matrix product almost, as it were, automatically. Uh, for this purpose, he uses an idea which we now call the inner product of two sets of numbers. He doesn't use that term, but it's equivalent to what he writes down. Supposing then we have two pairs of numbers, u1, u2, and a second pair, v1, v2. And for a certain reason which we see in a moment, I will write the first pair horizontally and the second pair vertically. Out of these two pairs, we make a single number called the inner product by multiplying u1 by v1 and u2 by v2 and then adding the two products. So that gives you the definition of the inner product of two pairs and the result is a single number. <coughs> 
Now, in order to obtain the matrix product AB, all we have to do is to form the inner products of each row of A with each column of B. Let's do this in a simple numerical case. <clears throat> I take for A the matrix 2, 3, 1, 1, which we've had before, and for B the matrix minus 1, 1, 2, minus 1. In order to prepare for multiplication, we divide A horizontally by a line, breaking it up into two rows, and we break up B by a vertical line, breaking it up into two columns. And now we form the inner product, shall we say, for the first row of A with the first column of B, which is 2, 3 into minus 1, 2, the result of which is 4. And so we go systematically to all the possible situations. We get four numbers, which are the product of the A, B, namely 4, minus 1, 1, 0. Once we've got product A, B, the question surely arises, what about B, A? Well, we can use the same numerical case to compute the product B, A. Now, of course, we have to divide B horizontally and A vertically. We form the row by column product <coughs> B, A, and we find that the matrix we obtain is minus 1, minus 2, 3, 5 which is totally different from the matrix we had found for AB. So we see then that, at least in general, AB is not equal to BA for matrix multiplication. This was perhaps a little disturbing at first, but when you come to think of it, it is not really so strange. Because we remember that A was an operation, the operation of moving the point from x to y. And similarly, B was an operation. Now, when we deal with operations and we are interested in their resultant or product, then it is not to be expected that AB is always equal to BA. Just to take a rather different type of example, supposing somebody wakes you up in the morning and gives you two commands. First, have a shower. The second, get dressed. Obviously, it makes a lot of difference in which order you carry out these two requests. And so the uh, breakdown of the commutative law of multiplication, though a little bit of a nuisance at first, is not uh, to be uh, wondered at. Now we have uh, the rest of the multiplication of matrices goes through rather easily and uh, in the way one would expect and hope. For example, there is an identity matrix which plays the role of the unity in numbers, and it is the matrix I, usually denoted by I, uh, is 1, 0, 0, 1. It has the property that AI is equal to IA is equal to A. So multiplication by the unit matrix is much the same thing as multiplying a number by the number unity. <coughs> The associative law of multiplication says that if you have three matrices, A, B, and C, and you multiply them A multiplied by B, C, and then A, or A, B multiplied by C is always the same. And so we don't need to put any brackets at all. We can simply write A, B, C. This is very fortunate, and if we had the choice in a new algebra to have either the commutative law or the associative law, holding then every time we would, I think, prefer to have the associative law in this algebra. Because one of the consequences of the associative law is the fact that we can now talk about the various powers of a single matrix A. Of course, A squared is the same as A times A. But when you come to A cubed, we could say A cubed is either equal to A times A squared or a squared times a. But fortunately, by virtue of the associative law, these two expressions are always equal, so that there is no ambiguity in talking about a cubed and similarly for any power of a square matrix. Then having powers of a matrix, we can string these together to form uh, functions. For example, we can form a polynomial function f of a, 
uh, of the form C naught I plus C one A plus C two A squared plus C N A to the N and so on, and possibly even more general functions. Cayley was very interested in this idea of um, forming functions of a square matrix. And he asked the question, having defined a polynomial in A, is there perhaps a polynomial of which A is, so to speak, a root? That is to say, a polynomial which is completely zero when you substitute A for it. And the answer is, yes, there is always such a polynomial. And this is uh, what is now known as the Cayley-Hamilton theorem and is probably the most interesting and far-reaching discovery uh, published in this memoir by Cayley. <clears throat> in the case of a two-by-two two matrix, the uh, polynomial, which is, so to speak, satisfied by A, can always be taken to be a quadratic polynomial. And um, it can be explained very easily how this is constructed. <clears throat> Giving the matrix A a completely arbitrary two-by-two two matrix, you form the polynomial A squared minus, now the coefficient of A is simply the sum of the diagonal elements of the matrix A. This sum is often called the trace of A. And the coefficient of I, the so-called constant term, is the determinant of A, which is A11, A22 minus A12, A21. Now, if you write down these three terms and substitute for A the matrix given above, you will find that all four coefficients are zero, so that we have a quadratic equation satisfied by the matrix A. Let me give you a, a numerical uh, illustration of this remarkable result, um, which um, Cayley published in, in this paper. Take the matrix which now it's studied several times. Uh, the matrix A equals 2, 3, 1, 1. If you find the square in the mm, usual way of multiplying a matrix by itself, you find you get 7, 9, 3, 4. The trace of the matrix is uh, 3, and the determinant is 2 minus 3, that is minus 1. So if we set up the what is called the characteristic equation of A, in this case, it's A squared minus 3 times A minus I. And if you substitute for A this numerical matrix, you will find that all four coefficients uh, reduce to zero. So we have a quadratic equation satisfied by this uh, matrix. Well, um, this was uh, certainly an interesting, um, I would say, exciting uh, fact. And uh, Cayley reports in this paper that he had also, also verified a corresponding result for a 3 by 3 matrix, where, of course, the equation is a cubic. He also gives a rule for saying what it would be like in an arbitrary n by n matrix, when the left-hand side would be a certain polynomial of degree n, which he describes correctly. But then he makes a rather curious and, we have to say, disappointing remark. He says, I have not thought it necessary to undertake the labor of a formal proof of the theorem in the general case of a matrix of any degree. So it is rather surprising that a man of Cayley's enormous mathematical power should not have pursued this discovery to its complete and final end. I'd like to show you um, what um, Cayley's paper actually looked like. And um, I would also, before I do this, show you a picture of Cayley himself. A photograph. But then here is the first page of, um, of the paper which uh, I have described. Now, this would be the first part of my talk. Uh, in the second part, I will tell you what happened to this paper in, in the history of mathematics and uh, what were the consequences and the further developments in the theory of matrix algebra. In the first part of my talk, I discussed Cayley's memoir with you, and the question will now be asked, what happened after that? 
Well, most surprisingly, nothing. The paper was totally ignored by Cayley's contemporaries and also for a long time after that. The reason for these, this, this neglect is quite difficult to understand. Surely it was a beautifully written paper, very clear, and contained most interesting mathematical discoveries. One suggestion that has been made, by, especially by Professor Hawkins, was the fact that Cayley published uh, this paper in the Transactions of the Royal Society of London. This, of course, is a very prestigious place of publication, but it is a journal which is read more by scientists than by mathematicians, and it is possible that it was therefore overlooked by, by them. Another uh, possible reason is that at that time, in the middle of the 19th century, most mathematicians were not yet ready to accept into mathematics objects other than the obvious geometrical or uh, algebraical objects uh, of mathematics. Things were either seen geometrically or something to calculate with or variables that stood for numbers. Uh, this is possibly the case, I say, although Hamilton discovered the quaternion some 15 years before Cayley's memoir. Nevertheless, quaternions are a kind of number, an obvious generalization of complex numbers. And so matrices were a further step in the direction of abstraction. Another reason which uh, has been suggested is the fact that Cayley himself did not seem to th think very highly of his discovery of matrix algebra. There is a story to saying that when he was asked about matrices, he would reply, well, yes, a matrix is like a map you carry in your pocket, neatly folded. But if you want to find anything, if you want to go anywhere, you have to take it out and spread it right out. In other words, he regarded a matrix more or less as a convenient shorthand for a set of numbers. This view is reinforced by his curious failure to pursue the proof of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. In fact, it took a long time before a proof was given in the literature. Now, uh, what happened was some 20 years elapsed before the subject of matrix algebra was taken up uh, again in full force. And this was done by the German mathematician Frobenius. Frobenius at that time worked in Zurich, and he wrote a large, very profound paper called Linear Substitutions and Bilinear Forms, in which he developed what was equivalent, at least, to the theory of matrices. But he did not use the word, nor did he refer to Cayley, whose work evidently he did not know. Cayley's work was finally uh, accepted and, and uh, was given credit by Frobenius about uh, 1896, where Frobenius, in another big paper on matrices, refers to Cayley and also gives the proof of the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. But Frobenius there attributes the idea of this proof to another German mathematician called Pasch, who published the result in 1891. But even that is 33 years after Cayley first enunciated the theorem. It can be said that by the year 1900, matrix theory was fully developed and had given rise to very interesting theories and applications throughout mathematics. But it is surprising that even then we had to wait perhaps two or three more decades until matrix theory became part of our mathematical teaching in universities. Why this was the case, I don't know exactly, but I think there were just not enough suitable textbooks. Textbooks were only just gradually coming out about 1930, and some of those were more for reference or for research purposes than for teaching undergraduates. One of the nicest books for teaching young students was a textbook by H. W. Turnbull at St. Andrews, 
who wrote a very nice book called Determinants, Matrices and Invariants. Shortly afterwards, Turnbull collaborated with Aitken, who was then in Edinburgh, and together wrote a, a book called Canonical Matrices, which contains an excellent account of the more advanced parts of matrix algebra. The teaching of matrix theory to undergraduates certainly was underway both at St. Andrews and Edinburgh in the early uh, 1930s when I went to St. Andrews myself and subsequently also in other British universities. But it is surprising that there has been such a long delay since the matrix, uh, matrix algebra was fully uh, developed. Well, uh, this was the beginning of um, having matrix theory adopted as a common knowledge amongst all mathematicians. But already then, uh, a movement spread which um, gave us a new idea about the teaching of um, linear algebra. And this movement uh, started in Germany after the First World War in the 1920s, where a school of very able mathematicians adopted an extremely abstract attitude towards developing algebra and brought forward what was called at first abstract algebra and then modern algebra and finally just algebra because by that time it had gained almost universal acceptance. One of the leaders of this school was Emmy Noether. She did not write textbooks, but had a large number of extremely able students. And one of these, Van der Waarden, uh, published a book called Modern Algebra in German in two volumes. It contained many of the ideas he had learned from Emmy Noether and also other mathematicians who worked in Göttingen at that time. This textbook on modern algebra was something totally new. It came like a bombshell, and it was unlike any other textbook which had been used uh, up till then. Its influence was enormous. However, the uh, attitude was one of extreme rigor, from the most general to the special, a very deductive system of presenting algebra. It so happens that in this uh, approach, linear equations or linear algebra did not appear until about halfway through the second volume. And of course, in that position, it would not be suitable to teach to first-year undergraduates. So we had to look for a simplified version of this approach to linear algebra. Well, it wasn't very long until this was forthcoming. One of the earlier books on vector spaces, which was quite suitable for undergraduate teaching, was the book by Halmos entitled Finite Dimensional Vector Spaces. This is what Halmos looks like now, but when he wrote his book 45 years or so ago, he, I can assure you, looked very different. So from 1945, 1950 onwards, we had quite suitable textbooks on linear algebra where the approach was to teach the subject through the um, ideas of vector spaces. Well, time does not allow me to give you a complete exposition of uh, vector spaces. It will uh, would take far too long. It suffices to, uh, to say that a vector space uh, consists of two objects called vectors, which I denote by small letters with a line underneath, and scalars, from our point of view, just real numbers, which I denote by ordinary letters A and B. And in a vector space, you have only two operations. You can add vectors, like uh, in the rule for the parallelogram law, which you learn in mechanics, and you can multiply a vector by a scalar, for example, if a is a real number greater than 1, then you have a u, a given vector, and a u is a vector parallel to this, a slightly bigger. And of course, you can do these two things together, and this leads to the notion of a linear combination, 
typically AU plus BV. This is quite simple, but uh, we're not satisfied with, with just one vector space. We want to consider two vector spaces uh, with the same set of scalars. And uh, let's say we have two vector spaces, V and W, and we have a map that goes from V to W, a map the same as a function. So we will say that W is a mu of V, or that W is the image of V under this map. And uh, this map is not an arbitrary map. For our purpose, it must be what is called a linear map. Now, the rules for a linear map are very easy to express. They say that the image of a sum shall be the sum of the images, and the image of a multiple of a vector shall be the same multiple of its image. So that gives it two rules which determine a linear map. This is the abstract formulation of uh, a linear map between two vector spaces. But uh, you cannot really do very much business, so to speak. In order to calculate uh, the actual image of a particular vector in general and to make any more precise uh, statements about the linear map, almost certainly you would have to introduce uh, a frame of reference or a coordinate system or a basis, all these things mean the same thing, in both V and W. And I have simply indicated this, such a basis by the numbers 1 and 2. And in order to shorten it, I call 1 and 2 the, the frame of reference in V and the frame of reference in W. If you have a frame of reference, then a vector V is simply a set of two numbers, namely the two components of that vector relative to the axes 1 and 2. And similarly, W is just a pair of numbers, say, y1 and y2. And the linear map, which we call mu, is expressed in terms of the coordinates. And what you get is uh, two equations, y1 equals, say, a11 x1 plus a12 x2, and y2 a21 x1 plus a22 x2, where the coefficients are real numbers. Now we've come right back to where Cayley started. A linear map is exactly what he called a linear transformation. And a linear transformation is entirely given by its coefficients, that is to say, by the matrix A. So we can say that the matrix A represents mu. This is true, but you must remember that all this came about by choosing a basis or a frame of reference. If we choose a different frame of reference in both V and in W, then the vector V, the same vector as before, has different components, say x1 dashed, x2 dashed, and the same vector W has different components, y1 dashed and y2 dashed. And the linear map between the two spaces is again represented by a pair of linear equations in the manner of Cayley, this time involving different coefficients which form a different matrix B. But this different matrix represents the same linear map. And so we come to the point of view that what really matters are the linear maps between vector spaces. But if you want to talk about them, you have to introduce a frame of reference. And this means you, have, you are able to represent the map by a matrix. But because of the difference in choosing different uh, bases, if we wish to do so, different matrices may represent the same map. And from that point of view, is, uh, the uh, map is the real thing, so to speak, and the matrices play a subordinate role, rather like uh, some philosophers say what really matters are ideas or concepts like beauty and truth and the relation between them. You, if you want to talk about these relations, you have to use a language. You can say it in English or in French or in German. It sounds very different, but it really represents the same thing. So matrices then, in a way, uh, are still necessary. We cannot talk about a matrix-free theory of linear algebra, but matrices um, take a a secondary role, and that is why I called my talk the rise and fall of matrix theory. Now, um, 
uh, just to indicate how, uh, in modern treatment, um, the relationship of vector spaces and matrices is usually uh, presented. I'm thinking of an excellent textbook which is often used, namely that of Hurstein, called Topics in Algebra. In this book, he introduces vector spaces, like the way I have done, on page 130, say, and matrices are not mentioned for another 100 pages. But then when he does mention them, he makes the point that it would be a mistake to um, deal with linear algebra solely from the abstract point of view of vector spaces, that we should study matrix algebra as well as vector spaces. Uh, this view was reinforced by uh, Olga Towski Todd, uh, who wrote to me from America, where she now works, saying that she was glad that um, matrix theory is still um, taught uh, alongside with the abstract view. She mentioned the fact that a few months ago she was asked to give a lecture for the American Mathematical Society, and she chose as her title why I became a torchbearer for matrix theory. Now this, I think, sums up what I would like to say, that both points of view are necessary, as also was pointed out by Hurstein. By all means, let us uh, present linear algebra in the language of, or in the form of, vector spaces. It makes the theory very smooth, very easy to follow, and also lends itself to generalizations to other parts of mathematics. But do not let us forget that matrix algebra also makes contributions to the subject in a way which vector spaces are not always able to make. And so the two together will make a much better and much more rounded picture, which I hope many of you will follow from now on. Thank you.